global numbering most students find is the Pons Asinorum of this course. So for those of you who don't know what the Pons Asinorum is, it is the bridge of asses, which is proposition five in Euclid's elements. And apparently that's the hard bit. And once you can do that, the rest is okay. So that's what we're going to try and nail down now. So if you recall, what we talked about last time, what you started and may or may not have finished implementing, is local numbering. So local numbering associates the nodes on an individual finite element with the topology of the reference cell. Now what we're going to do is global numbering. So global numbering is the mechanism by which we first of all associate the full set of global nodes and therefore global basis functions in our whole finite element space over the whole mesh with the mesh entities. And then we work out a way such that as we visit each cell, we get the right global entities in the right order. And that's what we need to be able to actually do integration, which is, after all, the thing we're after. And so we are currently working in section 4.3, as previously mentioned. I can't simultaneously write on the board and have that up, so you just need to have it up in front of you. So what are we doing? So we've got somewhere out there a mesh, and I will make a small mesh with... One, two, three, four, apparently five triangles. And we learnt a couple of weeks ago that we can number all of the entities in this mesh as pairs of dimension entity. So I might number the vertices 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, and 0, 5. And we also have cells. Can someone remind me what color I used in here for? I'm using blue for edges. I'll try to be consistent with what's on the, in the notes because it'll make everybody's life a little bit easier. So we also number the edges. Sorry, the edges will start with ones because they're one dimensional. One zero, one one, one two, one three, one four, one seven, one eight, one nine. Did I get them all? I think so. So now I've numbered every edge. It's arbitrary, right? Does not, in the global system, matter which numbers get associated where. Uh, your mesh generator will number stuff. It'll come out. And similarly, we have cells as well. So uh, this is cell 2, 0, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, and 2, 4. So that's one of the essential pieces of information. Somewhere out there, there is a mesh which is numbered. And we've got a mesh object, and the mesh object implements an adjacency relationship. So the adjacency relationship, remember, is this function, adj, let me go back to a black pen, dim1, dim2, um, i, so, or E probably I used. So, the function is parameterized by two dimensions. The first dimension, as we mentioned, must be greater than the second one. We'll see a bit later you need to extend that to greater than or equal to, but that's trivial. Uh, and what it tells you is the set of D2 entities which are adjacent to entity D1. 
and it will do it in an order consistent with the local topology. So what does that mean? Well, if I have my local triangle, which looks like this, and it has vertices 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, if I recall correctly, and edges, numbering opposite edges, so 1, 0 is there, 1, 1 is there, and 1, 2 is that one, and there's only one cell, so that's this guy. So, when you evaluate the adjacency relationship for one of these guys, it will return a list of entities of dimension two, and that list will be in this order. Now, how does this order correspond to this order over here? Well, the answer is you start with the vertices. You put the vertices in the same order, and then that tells you what order the other ones have to be. So let's work through that example to explain what's going on. So, edge 2, 0, um, 4, let's say for to make it the closest one. So this says the set of zero entities, i.e. vertices, adjacent to cell 24. So this is cell 24, and it will return these in this order. But this order thus far is slightly arbitrary. So that here for this we have a rule, and the rule is that the vertices come out in ascending order. So the lowest number vertex on this triangle is vertex 0, 1. So the first entry is going to be 1. The second lowest one is 2, so this will be 2. And this one will be 5. So that's all that guy does. That then implies the ordering of Edge two one four. So as two one four is the set of faces of this element, and they need to be in the consistent order. So that means that the first face must be the face opposite the first vertex. So the first vertex was this one, the opposite face is this one, so this is going to return six. And the second vertex is this one. The opposite face is this one, so it returns four. And the other one must be five. So that's what edge does. Um, and if I implement it, as you will need to, to two of four, I would get the set containing four. Because the only face which is adjacent to this guy is itself. So that's, uh, if, uh, if these two match, so adj um, xx of anything is itself. It's the identity function. Trivial. Okay, so that's one part. So now we know how Given a triangle, we can look up, or respectively an interval, but they're easier, uh, we can look up which global entities we're on. That's one of the pieces of the jigsaw that we need. Another piece of the jigsaw we already did, which is the local numbering. And I will put the local numbering up here. So let us, uh, because it's the first one which is non-trivial, assume that we are doing P3, so the cubic Lagrange triangle. So that guy has 
points that look like this. So I am certain that every single thing in this course counts from zero. Uh, so that is Python, right? So you might be used to maths where a lot, a lot, so mo, uh, a lot of mathematicians, especially pure mathematicians, count from one. Um, most programming languages count from zero. Therefore, computational mathematicians have a tendency to count from zero because then what you write on the board matches what you write in the code. Um, your ordering might be different, right? The specification of how to do Lagrange points did not tell you which order to do this in. In particular, uh, it's depending more or less arbitrarily on which way around you wrote your loops, your ordering might go up. It's fine. The ordering is arbitrary. What's not arbitrary is how we map the orderings together. Right? So you'll get a permutation. So if you did it in the numbers in a different order, you will get a different um, ordering from what I'm going to do. So this is what we did last time. And so uh, we have entity nodes. And entity nodes is, so entity node 0 in this case, uh, 0 goes, um, goes to 0, uh, 1 goes to 3, 2 goes to Nine. One goes to um, zero. Goes to so the zero side is this one, so that's six eight. Numbering essential, very importantly, in that direction. So six eight. If you don't go in the right direction, bad things happen. Um, one is this guy, which is four, seven. Two is, um, must be one, two. And two maps to the set five. So that's the local numbering. Now we can actually do the first formula that's in there. So what we now need to do is associate with um, each of these entities, so each global entity, the right number of degrees of freedom. And so for this particular element, the right number of degrees of freedom is uh, one if you're a vertex, two if you're an edge, and one if you're a triangle. You can ask the finite element to give you those numbers. If you look at the implementation of finite element, after you have provided entity nodes to finite element, it works out what those values are. Um, so we need to then associate to each one of these the right number of degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom need to be numbered in one big contiguous list. Because eventually, these things are going to be the entries in our vector and the rows and columns of our matrix. So we want a, con a contiguous set. So somehow, we have to get a contiguous set. You can mathematically validly use any mapping you like. If you are doing a kind of four-wheel implementation, then the order matters for performance, but not for correctness. Uh, it matters for performance because when you access memory on a computer, it is faster to access memory which is close to each other than it is to access memory that's far away. So what you do in four real finite element codes is you effectively sort this guy according to some sort of adjacency relationship and you allocate the degrees of freedom to entities in that order so that um, the degrees of freedom adjacent to adjacent cells are near each other in memory, and the memory performance is good. We're not going to worry that, about that. That, gets, that complicates the code massively. We will instead do something quite simple. What we will do is we will associate 
the degrees of freedom with these entities in entity order counting up from the vertices. So we need to associate one degree of freedom with each vertex. So degree of freedom zero will be associated with vertex zero, zero. Degree of freedom one will be with vertex one and all the way up. So the degree of freedom, what do we get up to? Five will be with vertex five. Then we go on to the faces. So face zero, wherever that is, that's here, we'll get degrees of freedom six and seven. And the next one will get degrees of freedom seven and eight and so on until I've associated two degrees of freedom with each one of these edges. And then finally, I need to associate one degree of freedom with each cell. So what I'll do is I'll take the total number of degrees of freedom I've already associated to vertices and the total number of degrees of freedom I've already associated to edges and then I'll keep counting on from there and hand them out one at a time to cells. If I were doing a different polynomial degree, I would do exactly the same process. I just hand out a different number of degrees of freedom per entity. So for continuous elements, it's always one per vertex. But if it were P1, that's where I'd stop. If it were P5, then I would have three on each edge and um, what is it? Three on the interior, something like that. So um, that produces a formula, which is the one at the start of 4.3, and I realize that I've committed the cardinal sin of not giving it a number. This is a lesson, and I am sitting here. When you write maths, you're writing your graduation projects or a paper, you number every single equation. It's a very bad habit that people have of only numbering the equations that they're going to refer to. So the problem with that is, after you have published your magnum opus, and some other person wants to say, go look at this equation in that paper, and you didn't number it, and they say, go look at the fourth equation on page 60 of this uh, paper, that's hopeless. So always number everything, because you never know who's going to refer to your numbers. So right now, I've committed that sin, and I'd like you to refer to the unnumbered equation at the start of section 4.3, uh, which says, so we're effectively defining another function. So this is the function g for global, and g di, so di is now a global entity, dimension index. g di is given by the sum of delta less than d, so the sum over all dimensions lower than the dimension of this entity, of n delta, which we define to be the number of degrees of freedom or the number of nodes on each entity of dimension delta, so one for vertices, two for edges in this case, times E delta, which is the global number of entities of that dimension in the mesh, and if you look at the mesh class, it has a method that will tell you what that number is, plus Right out of space here, i times n d. So this number is the number I've used up numbering all of the lower dimensional entities, and this is my position in the set of numberings of entities of my dimension. So that formula gives you the index of the first node, the first global degree of freedom, on entity di. And so the set of global degrees of freedom on entity di is simply the contiguous set of numbers which is starts at this number and is this number long. So if it's um, degree three triangles again then it starts at whatever number we start at, and if it's a vertex, it's just that number, and if it's an edge, it's that number and the next one, and if it's a cell, it's just that number, and that generalizes. So that's equation 